made it. Lunch was good. Now we get to let it settle with some good history. Uh, so our guest speaker today is Jay Blake Perkins, an Ozarks native who is an associate professor of history and associate vice chancellor for academics at Arkansas State University, BB. He is the author of Hillbilly Hellraisers, Federal Power and Populist Defiance in the Ozarks, and his work examines the steadfast culture of Ozarks rural defiance and anti-government sentiment by exploring the relationships between small farmers, capitalist elites, and the federal government during the 19th and 20th centuries. He believes that the experience in the Ozarks is in many ways a historical microcosm that raises important questions about working class relations with liberal state power more generally in the United States and perhaps globally. So without further ado, help me welcome Dr. Burke. Appreciate Dr. Wilkerson for the invitation to uh, come speak here today. This is a great museum. Uh, I just uh, I went to places like this all over Arkansas as I was working on this book. And it's just uh, it, museums like this and local history organizations just do really important work, as we all know. And uh, my book wouldn't have been possible without places like this. Local history that they preserve. Uh, so uh, appreciate this. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. All right. Uh, so technical difficulties were fixed, but if it can go wrong, I'm sure I can do it. The bottom left going for that. <laughs> bottom. bottom Down, left. Okay. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Just stay with you. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, before I launch into uh, whom I talk today about, about my book, uh, I want to just say a few things about the Ozarks. Uh, just curious, how many of you have ever been to the Ozarks before? Most of you, okay, good deal, all right. Uh, much of America knows the Ozarks uh, as the place where Branson is. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the tourism industry and, and all of that there. Um, but uh, the Ozarks is, uh, as you can see here, a big portion of it in Missouri, uh, northern Arkansas, some of parts of Oklahoma there. Uh, the Ozarks was uh, the earliest American settlement of the Ozarks really began in the early 19th century, uh, kind of that last wave of, uh, in which the Appalachian region was being settled. And so, there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of commonalities between the Ozarks and Appalachia, not just geographically, but socially, culturally, uh, and, and so on. There, um, uh, the, the uh, region, um, believe it or not, it's an upland region, right? So, it's geographers quibble with us about calling them mountains, even though that's the <laughs> so Actually, it's an eroded plateau, but but it looks like mountains to me. So. Uh, but anyway, uh, believe it or not, uh, parts of the region were cotton growing regions. Um, even as early as the 1820s, um, cotton began creeping into the narrow creek and river valleys and parts of the, you can nearly draw a line down the middle of the Arkansas part of the Ozarks. And the eastern half of the Ozarks uh, were known for, for growing cotton. Uh, in addition, of course, to corn and livestock, but, but cotton was a, a staple there, uh, and even parts of uh, southeastern Missouri as well. Uh, but, but after the Civil War, uh, King Cotton's kingdom expanded even more in the region, and you had these small yeoman farmers uh, trying to scratch out little patches of cotton on some pretty, pretty steep hillsides as well. So, so there is a history of, of cotton production in, in the Ozarks. Um, we sometimes forget about that. Let me try this again. Just, yeah, I've done it. I've done it. If you would go ahead and uh, move to the next slide. All right, so in September of 1897, U.S. Marshals B.F. Taylor and Joe Dodson led a moonshine bust in northeastern Pope County, Arkansas, a place described by Little Rock's Arkansas Gazette as one of the wildest regions imaginable remote from the centers of civilization where desperate mountaineers always stand ready to resist the invading arm of the law. 
According to the New York Times, the marshals walked into an ambush and the unerring aim of the lawless mountaineers made short work of them. Taylor and Dodson were killed on the spot and two others were wounded before the moonshiners bolted away. Let's go to the next slide. Over the next several weeks, authorities and the Taylor family offered a reward for the capture of the guilty parties and lawmen worked tirelessly to apprehend the suspects. More than a year later, officials finally nabbed their key suspect, a local Ozarks farmer named Hard Bruce. Such sensational scuffles between moonshiners and feds in the southern mountains seemed at first glance to highlight an exceptional culture of unbending anti-government attitudes, a culture assumed to have remained unchanged in geographic isolation and unmovable tradition since the pioneer settlers of the early 19th century. Tales of backwoods moonshiners resisting the feds, in fact, have probably contributed more than anything to shaping assumptions about a government-defying Ozarks culture that seems to live on today as strongly as ever in the age of Donald Trump. Next slide. National headlines and photos of 61-year-old Northwest Arkansas resident Richard Bigo Barnett occupying Nancy Pelosi's office chair with his foot propped on the House Speaker's desk during the January 6, 2021 Capitol riot seem to only reinforce long-standing images of the Ozarks as an exceptional bastion of anti-government and especially anti-Washington culture. Perhaps then, some may speculate, there's something in those Ozarks hills and hollers, or maybe the region's pristine waters that harbors an innate, timeless heritage of don't tread on me, damn government defiance. But in truth, history is far more complicated and sometimes surprising. Probing deeper into the 1897 moonshine affair in Polk County, for instance, reveals that the burdens of an increasingly uneven rural political economy actually had more to do with hard bruises and his fellow distillers' resistance than some exceptional culture. Next slide, please. Ozarkers like Bruce, who distilled theirs and their neighbor's corn into marketable whiskey, often resisted because they felt unjustly obstructed from pursuing an agricultural pursuit that helped sustain their way of life and modestly prosperous family farmers in opportunity-strapped hill communities. It's also interesting that, contrary to the common perception of moonshine wars as clashes between parochial rural folks and government outsiders intruding into local affairs with their bureaucratic agendas, a closer look at the violence in Polk County shows a contest for power between locals within the region in Gilded Age America. More than some ingrained hatred for Washington, Bruce and his moonshining comrades resented most local elites like Taylor and Dodson, a couple of well-to-do Ozarkers whose business and political connections had landed them their salary positions in the U.S. Marshal Service and John T. Burris, a wealthy mill owner in their neck of the woods, who was, one of, who was the one who had gone to Little Rock in the first place to demand that the state's head collector of the IRS deploy federal lawmen to clean up the still-infested mountains. Bruce's and his fellow moonshiners' defiance is best understood in the context of the populist political ethic that swept the region during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These small farmers were no conservative defenders of anti-Washington, small government orthodoxy. Far from it. Thousands of Ozarkers had joined homegrown organizations such as the Brothers of Freedom in the 1880s, which vowed to defend working folks against big moneyed interests, quote, who proposed not only to live on the labors of others, but to speedily amass fortunes at their expense. Next slide, please. The Brothers of Freedom and similar groups had merged with the National Farmers Alliance by the 1890s, a self-described union of labor forces that declared in its 1892 political platform, quote, we believe that the power of government, in other words, of the people, should be expanded as rapidly and as far as the good sense of an intelligent people and the teachings of experience shall justify to the end that oppression, injustice, and poverty shall eventually cease in the land. To find assumptions about rural people's traditional dread of federal power, the Alliance's list of demands included the creation of progressive income taxes to be leveled on corporations and the wealthy 
a government takeover of transportation and communications industries, a liberal expansion of the national money supply, regulations to curb absentee land ownership and real estate speculation, and a sub-treasury plan in which the federal government would build and manage a network of warehouses where farmers could store commodities for collective marketing and obtain low interest loans through the U.S. Treasury Department. Moreover, they lauded the efficiency and public service of the U.S. Postal Service as a model for the modernized, people-serving potential of the federal government, advocating for, for, for rural free delivery and a system of postal savings banks to protect working people from the predatory interest rates of commercial banks and merchants. Interestingly, the postal savings bank idea was resurrected by Bernie Sanders during the 2016 presidential race and has since then gained support from liberal politicians such as Kristen Gillibrand and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Farmers Alliance members in the late 1800s also proposed direct elections for U.S. Senators, which eventually resulted in the 17th Amendment in 1913, a constitutional amendment that is criticized today by many Tea Party conservatives. The Alliance endorsed a government-enforced eight-hour workday for industrial workers, too much to the chagrin of many business conservatives who chafed at meddling in free enterprise. Next slide, please. After the populist political tide subsided in the late 1890s, thousands of rural Ozarkers continued on as members of the National Farmers Union, which political scientist Elizabeth Sanders says, quote, was probably the broadest and most progressive of any grassroots organization of the early 1900s. Hundreds of rural Ozarkers also even organized and joined local chapters of the Socialist Party, asking, quote, by what tr rule of truth, right, or justice has any other person to uh, right to labor's production? And drawing on a combination of Republican ideals expressed in the Declaration of Independence, the moral teachings of Jesus Christ, and the political theories of Karl Marx. So then, these folks were not the hard-shell, anti-government mountaineers, simplistically depicted in much of Ozark's legend and lore. In this gilded age of concentrating wealth, growing inequality, and rural dispossession, many working-class Ozarkers demanded a good cleaning out of the rich and powerful from government institutions and a restoration of people's rule in order to meet the newest challenges of modernizing America. Similarly, this original populist ethic complicates long-held views about working-class rural folks as the nation's most militaristic people, always ready to fight in their nation's wars. Ironically, some of the most explosive challenges to federal power in the Ozarks in the early 1900s <clears throat> involved rural people resisting the military draft in 1917 and 18. Why? To many rural Ozarkers, the Great War was a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. Next slide, please. Take, for example, let me skip one. You can go to the next one there. Got to hang here. Yeah, that one right there. Back there. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Take, for example, Sam Fabus, the father of Arkansas's notorious post World War II era governor, Orville Fabus. <laughs> A descendant of Scots Irish immigrants who settled in Appalachia in the 1750s and who fought in the Revolutionary War. Faubus was never shy about his dream for economic and political equality. I'd rather be an honest peasant taking my living from the soil than to be a rich parasite living by others' toil, he once penned in a poem. Faubus was a member of the theologically ultra-conservative Combs Church of Christ, where perhaps, ironically, considering the typically staunch political conservatism of most members of Churches of Christ today, he first encountered socialist ideas and became an ardent supporter of Eugene V. Debs' presidential campaigns. As the World War raged on in September 1918, authorities jailed Fabus for distributing seditious literature and uttering numerous disloyal remarks concerning the conduct of the war. For Fabus and many other like-minded folks in the Ozarks, the war effort was little more than greedy interests manipulating to their economic advantage the uneven status quo of government power, all at the expense of hard-working commoners like themselves. And by the way, Oral Fabus didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> 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 
Armed resistance even broke out, for instance, in Newton County. Uh, Newton County, Arkansas's Cecil Cove. Go to the next slide, please. There, amid nearly impenetrable mountains that one newspaper said would fill a stranger's soul with trepidation, as many as 36 evaders and their family members had armed themselves and signed a covenant to resist the draft. After the potentially explosive affair ended peacefully and anticlimactically, the Kansas City Star weighed in to comment with amusement that, quote, Cecil Cove and the most remote fastness of the North Arkansas Ozarks had baffled the United States government, or the Wilhelmstrasse had failed the job. Bernstorff, Von Poppen, Dernberg, and their like couldn't fool Uncle Sam's agents, but the boys in the Ozarks could and did. Framing the story with typical stereotypes, the newspaper commented that time swings far backward in this rugged community. The little log cabins that house families of eight and ten seem to belong to another era. Rifles of several stages with a long barreled muzzle loader to the most modern repeater hung above the open fireplaces. Corn pone, corn fed hogs, and sorghum molasses are the culinary standbys. Pa and Ma and the majority of the kids smoke corncob pipes, sometimes use snuff, and always are unerring spitters. The youngest of the family is considered deserving of a reprimand if he cannot hit the fireplace at ten paces. The mountain folk are suspicious of strangers, but are peculiarly hospitable. It is something of, akin to an insult if the wayfarer does not stop and partake in their hospitality, but he will find it difficult in getting questions answered. While the press emphasized an exceptional Ozarks culture, local farmer preacher George Slate told reporters that, quote, the good book says, thou shalt not kill. We didn't want our boys taking nobody's life, because it's contrary to the Bible and the good Lord's teachings. When a reporter asked why the evaders could violently take up arms against the authorities, Slate responded, the boys wasn't going to kill nobody unless they had to. It's different killing a man who tries to make you do wrong and killing somebody in a war. Slate's son-in-law, a rural socialist, added that his family and many neighbors believed the U.S. war effort was a scheme, quote, for the benefit of them silk-hatted fellers up in New York. We don't want our boys fighting in rich fellers' battles and get killed just to make a lot of money for a bunch of millionaires, he explained, while they owe most of the country now. The historical memory of these anti-war sentiments in the Ozarks was scrubbed mostly clean after World War I, but this fiery draft resistance sprang from the same populist ethic that, on the one hand, demanded radical expansions of federal power to improve economic and political democracy, and yet, on the other, inspired skepticism and defiance of many federal interventions that purportedly intended to improve the human condition by helping the business classes. So how do we reconcile what may seem at first glance like rural working class Ozarkers Jekyll and Hyde relationship with federal power? Many pundits then and now seem content to chalk up this seemingly bipolarity to unsophisticated and reactionary rural culture. Others, like social scientist James C. Scott, tend to point the finger at distant, out of touch bureaucracies and how their imperialistic, one size fits all reform policies too often neglected local knowledge and customs, thus turning rural folks who might have otherwise welcomed assistance and new opportunities into obstinate rebels against the state. But I'm more convinced by historical explanations. Next slide, please. While many working class Ozarkers hoped for a populist moment to put political leaders in the driver's seat who were accountable to common folks like themselves, they understood and often resented the fact that local business elites controlled the status quo levers of federal power in their home areas. In fact, significant control of most federal programs, no matter how sincerely their creators sought to bring about change, was delegated from Washington to comfortable local elites who typically had far less interest in helping small farmers than improving their own business opportunities. We do well to remember, for instance, that most G-men who were held in on ridding moonshining from the region were in fact well-heeled local businessmen and not outsiders from D.C. And that local draft boards during World War I, which made the big decisions on which locals received exemptions and which ones did not, were typically well-connected town businessmen, county politicians and large landowners, and not bureaucrats from Washington. We often gloss over socioeconomic differences in regions like the Ozarks, 
but they were vital to understanding rural defiance. Next slide, please. Resistance to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's efforts to eradicate cattle ticks in the early 1900s is another good example of this intra-regional conflict over federal power. Prompted by more prosperous cattle growers who were beginning to raise imported purebred stock in the South, the USDA launched a program to wipe out tick fever, which was killing and inhibiting the weight gain of choice beef breeds. The USDA assumed at first that all cattle growers would welcome the program, but soon found that smaller and poorer farmers were reluctant to comply. Next slide, please. Their native scrub cattle were largely immune to the disease from generations of exposure, and the pains of rounding up these animals on the open range to drive them to dipping vats every other week was costly and nearly an impossible task. They also resented the flat tax levy to fund the state's portion of the federal programs. So officials began hiring inspectors, usually local elites with connections to the program, and working with sheriff's departments to force compliance. Some more obstinate Ozarkers dynamited concrete dipping vats, posted warnings for inspectors to stop the program. Tempers flared. On March the 20th, 1922, one federal inspector, Charles Jeffrey, was gunned down by a concealed assassin in Independence County. Jeffrey was the well-to-do owner of two farms and a blacksmith shop, and many of his neighbors who opposed tick eradication despised his federal authority to impose a burdensome program on them that only benefited a handful of well-connected elites. A Stone County man, mocking the greed and corruption of the program, put it this way, This will be a lonesome old place to live when the tick, eradic tick eradicators get all the ticks eradicated. They may eradicate for a thousand years and there will not be any difference in the amount of ticks. The one tick thereafter is a big round tick. I call it a dollar. The poor we have with us always. The populist ethic persisted among working class Ozarkers into the Depression era of the 1930s. Many, even in Republican strongholds that dated from the Civil War era, hoped that President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal would finally wield public power in ways that would advance economic democracy and opportunities for rural working people. One Ozarker wrote to a local newspaper in 1934 praising the New Deal's, quote, entirely new concept of the function and duty of government. Traditionally, our government was supposed to do little in time of depression except keep the tracks clear for such revival as private industry might be able to bring about, he wrote. But now, its responsibility is to provide jobs for the people. While our federal government is growing stronger, he thought, we shall have to admit that the old Jeffersonian concept of government is no longer applicable. At least we're getting better adjusted to our environment, he concluded. Next slide. <clears throat> Even so, many Ozarkers soon felt the unevenness and limitations of many New Deal programs, which were, once again, typically implemented locally by state and local elites. Agricultural programs especially tended to favor large landowners and agribusiness operators. In December 1933, more than 200 hill farmers met at a local courthouse for a meeting called by the Searcy County Farmers Independent Association. Several small farmers voiced considerable dissatisfaction with farm programs, contending that, quote, the small farmer needs relief, too. The group sought to awaken federal officials to, quote, the needs of the common people. Writing that same month, a rural teacher complained that despite the fact that the New Deal has done many things, it had benefited the small hill farmer, but very little. Ozarks elites usually mostly used their control of new federal resources to promote industrial and agribusiness growth, confident that development would alleviate poverty and raise all boats with new business ventures and job creation. Next slide. Arkansas Congressman Clyde Ellis led a charge to tap federal resources for massive infrastructure projects. He and his supporters promised the dawning of a new day because the project should considerably stimulate business so that thousands of people will be given work. Ellis worked to add provisions for the construction of a series of hydroelectric dams on the White River to the 1938 Flood Control Act. Inspired by the new Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, and extensive reservoir projects in the West, Ellis called for a White River Authority, or WRA. Dam supporters in Arkansas announced that Quote, we should now glory in the fact that we too are getting federal money. 
One state official boasted that Arkansas today is sitting in the lap of the gods. Congressman Ellis pressed on for a TVA model program in the Ozarks, declaring that its passage would mean the difference between poverty and prosperity because it would provide for the agricultural and industrial development of the White River Valley, generate cheap electricity for every district in my home, or every home in my district, and provide jobs for everybody who wants to work. The WRA never materialized, largely due to the powerful lobby of private utility companies that scoffed at what they claimed was a Soviet-style communist program. But after Ellis and other supporters compromised to ensure the private Arkansas Power and Light Company, the contract to distribute electrical power to customers from the federally constructed Norfolk Dam in Baxter County, the project moved forward under the Army Corps of Engineers. While federally funded construction on these dams created good jobs while they lasted, benefits for small farmers and local workers were mostly temporary and ended once the projects were completed. Next slide. <clears throat> a thriving tourism industry in a few towns like Mountain Home, Heber Springs, and Bentonville that took on characteristics in keeping with America's post-World War II affluent society. But the dams generally failed to expand long-term opportunities in rural communities for native Ozarkers. In fact, while several lost their farms to eminent domain to make room for the watersheds, a disproportionate amount of the new wealth and property along these lakes was owned by a handful of local business elites and a growing population of immigrants from the urban Midwest. Indeed, the post-World War II years witnessed the rapid demise of rural communities in the Ozarks. Next slide. Adding to the declension of family farming in the 1940s, employment in agriculture fell from 28.2% to 13.4% in the Ozarks in the 1950s. The loss of opportunities for small farmers put many families on the migrant trails. During the 1950s alone, the region netted a loss of 431,000 people. Poverty plagued thousands who stayed behind. In 1959, per capita income stood at only 60% of the national average, and the poverty rate more than doubled the national average. Rural Ozarkers like Martha Wagner of Cleburne County continue to see an important role for government. She had written Governor Sidney McMath because, quote, everybody is leaving here to hunt work. Her family and neighbors, she explained, will grow any kind and all kinds of vegetables, corn to pumpkins, if we had a big government canner here that could buy, uh, could can and buy what they raised, Wagner thought, people could stay in their homes and have a good income and not have to leave to go to California or Michigan to work. But most leaders had determined that rural communities would be best served by incentivizing corporate industrialization and agribusiness development rather than enhancing opportunities for, many, for, for, for family farmers. And they aim to grow the undeveloped region in newfound prosperity. Next slide. In 1966, federal and state officials coordinated to create the Ozarks Regional Commission, or ORC, one of five federal commissions authorized by the Public Works and Economic Development Act of 1965. The Ozarks seemed a logical, place, uh, logical choice to follow the bigger and better funded pilot program, the Appalachian Regional Commission. Despite conservatives like Barry Goldwater's claims that these programs were dangerous Marxist schemes, Many Ozarkers initially held high hopes. But the lion's share of ORC programs, mostly industrial infrastructure projects, went to more prosperous growth center towns like Fayetteville and Harrison. The poorest counties did not receive a single dime. Promises that economic growth would trickle out into the countryside rarely materialized. Some politicians like Dale Bunkers cried that the ORC was nothing but a cruel hoax arguing that far more federal dollars would have to be committed to even begin fulfilling its mission. To examine the better funded Appalachian program suggests that more money would pro have probably only led to more unevenness and rural decline. Ozarkers were sorely disappointed. Many would have undoubtedly shouted amen to a newspaper editorial in Iowa, Kansas in 1979, which blasted the government's, quote, conspicuous waste of taxpayers' dollars for its overblown, expensive annual report, which will never be seen by the public the commission was created to serve. A basic summary report, report would have been sufficient, the editorial reason, but 
Such a utilitarian economical approach would never do because an opportunity to puff up the ORC staff and the elected officials would go unseized. It's another example of government for the sake of government rather than government with the public in mind. When a copy of the newspaper reached the desk of one ORC staff member a few days later, he cussedly scribbled in the margins, you can't win an ass-kicking contest with a skunk. But when Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan entered the White House with his budget-cutting acts in 1981, it's doubtful that many rural Ozarkers objected too strongly when he felled the ORC. If federal development schemes disappointed many Ozarkers, the government's war on poverty, which aimed to tackle poverty from the bottom up, ironically provoked bitter resentment. But the impetus for resistance to federal power was very different this time. Unlike working folks' grassroots defiance in the late 1800s and early 1900s, now it was mostly local businessmen who led a charge against federal power that better resembles the prevalence of conservative, anti-government attitudes so common in the region today. Next slide. Interestingly, local businessmen were initially enthusiastic about the war on poverty. But they soon learned that the poverty programs would work differently than economic development initiatives. The poverty programs aim to spur community action among working and poor people, and specifically encourage low-income participation. Concerned mainly about the need to help poor blacks living under a southern political structure controlled by segregationists, the Lyndon Johnson administration originally designed its poverty programs to circumvent local, and, uh, local political establishments in order to take assistance directly to the poor. When it became clear, then, that community action would spoil the elite's expectations for local control, they quickly mobilized against what they viewed as federal intrusiveness. In June 1965, for instance, officials in several counties in western Arkansas formed the Arkansas River Valley Area Council, or ARVAC, expecting the agency to capitalize on federal poverty grants. Bob Atkinson, who became executive director of ARVAC, Remember that initially, the group leadership thought they were getting an economic development grant. Local officials soon realized, though, that the grant was really anti-poverty money. When President Johnson's program chief, Sergeant Shriver, arrived in Little Rock to finalize RVAC's first grant application, Atkinson recalled that the Washington official was met by a contingent of bankers and power people, prompting Shriver to ask them where the poor folks were. Our leadership was thinking economic opportunity, Atkinson explained, but didn't realize focus was going to be solely on poverty. The requirements for community action and maximum feasible participation of the poor irritated most local elites who felt entitled to manage federal programs as they saw fit. One of the most controversial programs was Volunteers in Service to America, or VISTA. Modeled on JFK's International Peace Corps, VISTA deployed federally trained volunteers to America's needy areas to help energize poor people to improve their lives and communities. As it turned out, for those already in power, writes one historian, this was nothing short of subsidized anarchy. Protests arose almost immediately from business interests and big agriculture. This is Arthur Alexander of Little Rock, wired Governor Favis in May 1964 to warn him that, quote, you are losing hundreds of votes from the farmer, the planner, and the big and little businessman by endorsing, endorsing Washington's poverty agenda. There are more of us than there are of the no work, all play group, she said. Instead of a wasteful government program, Alexander advised to have jobless men register with the employment agency. After all, she and her husband were currently looking for tractor and transport drivers and men's, men for other jobs. Next slide. The powerful Arkansas Farm Bureau also quickly called for the war on poverty's removal from the state. Similarly, the executive vice president of the Arkansas Chamber of Commerce asked whether this great, big, prosperous, booming America of ours really needs to embark on an enormously costly and paternalistic spending spree to wipe out poverty among the less affluent. Anyone who wants to go in business for himself finds the way open. And those who want to work, who want to make a life for themselves and their families, are doing it, he contended. Will the lavishing of taxpayers' dollars on all sorts of visionary schemes be likely to inculcate in such persons habits of industry and thrift and thus eliminate improvidence from the American scene? Many white Ozarkers came to view federal poverty programs 
as little more than handouts for what they viewed as undeserving blacks and radical use. Negative publicity from over in eastern Arkansas helped color many white Ozarkers' perceptions, why animosity raged in the lowland delta region. In June 1969, an angry mob beat two VISTA volunteers with coffee cups and other items at a cafe in Hughes, an assault that severed one of the victim's arteries. In November 1969, white landowner T.H. Barker wrote an angry letter to the Arkansas Gazette claiming that, quote, Lee County did not acquire this poverty status until a group of bureaucrats decided we should wear this label. I hope the volunteers have been frustrated by the farming empire, for we have been frustrated by many bureaucratic mandates that you and your kind have administered on an unsuspecting community. Not surprisingly, the local White Citizens Council also condemned what it called the NAACP, National Association for the Agitation of Colored People, OEO, VISTA, Vipers and Subversion to America, and other troublemaking organizations. These same communist organizations are the cause of the population ratio in Mariana to change to a black majority recently. Are you going to join with others now or after they burn your business or home or assault your wife or daughter? Asked the White Citizens Council. Even in the Ozarks, which by the mid 20th century was comparatively one of the whitest regions in the country, black activism stirred controversy over poverty programs. One of the region's few black communities resided in East Fayetteville, near the University of Arkansas. Next slide, please. Bobby Morgan, a native son of the neighborhood, wrote a successful grant for a mobile social clinic to provide medical services, library resources, and information about social assistance programs. The $480,000 grant, however, was used for other things by local leaders, according to Morgan. He himself became the bane of local elites. He claimed that after he started a new program for hungry children, entrenched political and business elites ordered health inspectors to shut it down. By 1968, financial irregularities finally led to an investigation of the elite-controlled Washington County Agency. One federal official noted in a memo that the agency is shot through with corruption and guessed that the VISTA volunteers will probably be asked to leave because of what they have exposed. Poverty programs encouragement of black political participation also ruffled feathers. We started to penetrate with info about elected officials, Morgan explained, and the power folks raised hell. Next slide. For their part, poverty reformers usually posed a weak challenge to local elites' assaults on the programs. Most poverty warriors who came to the Ozarks primarily aimed to tackle the region's supposedly pathological culture of poverty. Many believed that rural people were perpetuating their own impoverishment by clinging to outdated customs, values, and traditions. This assumption effectively placed the burden of poverty on the poor and ignored its real sources, namely the destruction of the region's small farms and the post-war economy's gross unevenness. It also tended to offend the proud pe uh, people reformers aimed to help. When Vista volunteer Anna Gottlieb of Illinois found out she had been assigned to Arkansas, she, quote, seriously thought of leaving the program altogether. To me, she explained, Arkansas was the backwards of backwards and just a place where you were born and stuck in. Rural whites' religious fundamentalism also typically figured high on the liberal reformers' list of cultural problems that had to be overcome. While reformers often worked successfully with African-American churches in American cities, they were unable or un unwilling to connect with religious sentiments among rural whites. Conservatives in the region, meanwhile, forged a new climate of popular religious dissent directed at godless liberalism and a meddling federal government. Unlike leaders of the farmers' unions who had helped mobilize challenges to the status quo in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, 1960s and 70s poverty reformers rarely connected with the rural dispossessed. Next slide. Today, conservative, anti-government political culture in the Ozarks is rooted far more in these later upheavals of the 1960s and 70s than in the older populist culture that inspired resistance to federal efforts to suppress moonshine, draft country boys during World War I, and enact so-called improvements in agriculture. In fact, the conservative agenda of defiance today often seeks to tear down many of these same federal powers that the region's rural forefathers 
helped to create. There's actually a uh, uh, amendment on the ballot right now in Arkansas to uh, weaken the uh, ability of voters to propose initiated acts, which was one of the signature achievements of the populist platform. <clears throat> the small farm society and populist politics that once sustained rural Ozarkers working class democratic defiance has now been mostly extinct for more than 50 years, supplanted by popular new Ozarks conservatism that came to dominate the airwaves and other media, including social media today, pulpits, and coffee, coffee shop conversations. This newer conservative defiance has thrived in an uneven regional economy of light manufacturing, retail, agribusiness, and seasonal tourism, a political economy that hinges on a low-wage labor force, low taxes, and minimal government regulation. Contrary to common stereotypes of rural continuity and permanence, especially in a hill region like the Ozarks, things have changed, and people have changed, over the past 130-plus years, just as they had changed before that. This includes political cultures and dynamics of attitudes about the damn government. And while it's difficult to see from our present vantage points, like it or not, whether you welcome change or dread it, as long as people remain in them by our hills and hollers, they will again someday, if not sooner than later. Last time. All right, that's all I've got. Please put them in the chat, and I'll be able to ask them in person where everybody can hear. But for now, anyone have questions? Uh, I have a question for Dr. Perkins. You were talking about the, the new rebelliousness of the federal government versus the old. Uh, seems to me I recall from the book some mention of how the population, the demographics have shifted a little bit uh, with the influx of northerners. That is true, yes. And can you talk about that a little bit? So I, I'm, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so yes, uh, as I mentioned just, just a few minutes ago, uh, I think it was in the 50s, it was a net population loss of about 431,000 people. And so beginning really in the, in the 60s and running on through the 70s and, and even more, I think, it's still going on today, uh, there has been a significant wave of uh, uh, what a historian Brooks Blevins calls a population replacement going on there. So you've got this dynamic where uh, a lot of uh, Midwestern retirees move into the region and buy relatively cheap property, and of course they bring their political attitudes with them. And, uh, and many of those, especially earlier ones, and probably today as well, you know, brought with them that flight from, from the urban, uh, you know, urban turmoil, as they would call it, right, from the 60s and 70s, and, and uh, so yeah, that has been a, a really an important dynamic, and I, you know, I think, I'm not a historian of the Republican Party in Arkansas, but there is a, kind of interesting, there was a, a governor, uh, Winthrop Rockefeller, one of the Rockefellers, uh, elected in 66, I believe, was in Arkansas, and, uh, but he was, he was more uh, more progressive. I mean, at this at this time where you start to see this, you know, backlash in the South against the Civil Rights Movement and so forth. Rockefeller was, for instance, uh, I believe the only Southern governor who uh, kind of publicly mourned the death of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, and, and uh, but and Rockefeller had hoped to create a, uh, a two-party system in Arkansas, but his Republican Party really didn't latch on, and, uh, and, and, and the, the, I think the, the party of today, in many ways, was born. A lot of those early leaders of, that, of the Republican Party in Arkansas were many of those Midwestern and migrants who, who came in and so on. So, yeah, good point. You called them Hellraisers. Are you saying by that that they were actually <laughs> breaking laws? That's some cases, and in, in, some, in a few cases, killing folks. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean that's that's yeah that's I mean obviously I'm you know 
was, was looking at, at some of the most dramatic cases, right? I mean, cases that show up in the court records where we have some doc, documentary evidence to look at. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, in some cases they were, were breaking laws. On the draft resistance, um, I, I would say, from what I can tell, probably if you'd asked most folks in April 1917, when we entered the war, you think this is a good idea? Most of them would have said, heck no, it's not a good idea. There was a, there's a pretty good book on, uh, out there on the resistance to World War I and throughout the South uh, by Jeanette Keith. It's actually, her title is Rich Man's War, Poor Man's Fight. Um, it gets into that. But, but to your point about breaking laws, the vast majority, you know, weren't those kinds of rebels, right? I mean, they, they tend to fall in line uh, afterward, uh, even if they were drudging about it. Um, and so the cases I looked at were those that actually ended, ended up in the court courtroom uh, uh, and in the newspapers. Uh -huh. so, yeah. The farm the farm group uh, did they require like uh, <laughs> memberships with donate uh, you know annual payment or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, they had dues that they paid. Dues. Yeah, I just I mean okay, uh, I couldn't tell you what, how much they were or anything. <laughs> but, uh, I was just wondering how organized that was. Yeah, is what I was trying yeah. to figure out. And that's a good question and something I'm kind of curious about too. Um, okay. Looking at. If I ever get time, <laughs> kind of the, some of the dynamics of those kind of local farmers unions, and because uh, I've seen, I, I'm thinking, for instance, uh, uh, just came across it was there were some minutes actually, which is pretty rare, of a uh, of a uh, it was a farmers alliance meeting in a little local community there in Lawrence County where where I'm from, and uh, they were debating about. Uh, uh, Coxey's army, right, the march on march on Washington. And some of them were thinking, yeah, that, we need to support that. Others were, no, no, we're not getting involved in that. So there were there were definitely disagreements within those groups. Right? So I think you did a great job showing the changes in uh, the relationship with the government and the way the government was viewed in the region. I wonder, what do you think about the use of the phrase or the word populism to describe more recent? The Jimmy Carter on up through conservatism. That's a great question. <laughs> and is that a, a useful term, or does that obscure more than it helps? Yeah, I, I think it, in a historical uh, sense, I don't like the, the use of the term populist to describe, you know, our current current affairs. Um, uh, Charles Postel, um, if you're familiar with his work, but, um, has done some stuff with that, um, and uh, so. So yeah, I, there's some debate about that, and um, you know, I think uh, a lot of Hofstadter's work in the '50s and '60s, he, he he used that label to really describe, you know, McCarthyism and, and, and this more more reactionary politics and so forth. But that seemed to stick, and uh, journalists picked up on that. But, but yeah, in historical sense, I you know, I uh, I, I may even use it today. I, to talk about the original populism. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you talked about some of the changes in the uh, the region and the changes in how they view government, the early opposition to government, and especially local government, is driven by the farmers, whether it be sharecroppers, landowners, whatever, but the poorer farms, not the big you know, corporate farms. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about certainly the cultural issues with regard to the war on poverty and race getting involved. But you also mentioned that more recently there's been a shift in the labor force to service industries and, and things like that. Whereas that earlier opposition had come from uh, people connected to the land. Do you see any relationship there that so many few, fewer people are connected to the land in the same way. That's a good point. I, you know, that, that's that's definitely true. Um, you might want to repeat that for the Zoom people. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think there is something about that, uh, and, and just that uh, 
those, the presence of those local communities, right, that, that, and their identities, and seeing themselves really as they as they really were apart from the, the county seat folks over there, right? And that that dynamic I think is really blurred uh, uh, with centralization and you know so forth. And same thing. I mean, you get into that with rural churches, right? I mean, you know, um, there's been there's been a good deal of centralization and uh, you know kind of homogenization in a lot of ways uh, with, with that. So, so yeah, that's a good point. I think there is there is something there with the the collapse really of these more distinctive rural communities and yeah that, that tie to the land there um, really small small farmers um, most of them own land I and mean, the sharecropping did rise in in the region um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s that's that's often not you know really recognized or talked about but it did uh, of course that would turn sharecroppers even more against the that's right. elite that controlled the land. That's right, but I, but but to that, uh, there, there there were also there's also another dynamic there going on um, that we, we sometimes maybe miss, and that in the late 1800s, as as you know, farms are beginning to consolidate more, you know, wealthier, larger landowners begin buying up all the creek bottom land and the, the better better land, and even if even if some of these small farmers don't end up as sharecroppers, they end up getting pushed up pushed up the hillsides, right, into more marginal lands, and, and so anyway, I think that's uh, kind of a, something we sometimes forget about. That uh, there were there were still landowners, but they had a lot more in common with sharecroppers than they did with their bigger landowning counterparts down in the river bottoms and creek bottoms. Any other questions? So, do you see the, I mean, there's not going to be a clear moment, do you see the sort of clear breaking points in how we redefine some of these terms to keep using the same political speech? So you mentioned that early on, right, um, the poor small farmers, right, small operators, really the resentment is to the local elites and the regional elites, the rich people who they know directly. And then it's a little more to the big corporations, right? And people run the railroad companies and you know the oil companies in New York City. And then we get post World War II, and the economy changes dramatically, race tensions rise dramatically, and suddenly the elites start to become very distant people, and the local elites start using that same language to find right. the poorer people nearby them and say, "I'm not the elite. Those people way far away from us are the elites." Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think the World War areas are, are pivotal. One and two, um, Farmers Union. I mean, it took a knocking, World War One, um, kind of, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the war and tying it to a lot of the resistance and so forth, you know, and, and, uh, and socialism, right, the Bolshevik scare and all that stuff uh, really, really did uh, Heard a lot of those earlier, you know, organizations, um, and then and then they were often replaced by similar-sounding organizations, right? That that co-opted a lot of the same kind of language. I mean, they they saw what was working. Right? They saw they saw what uh, you know they, they they figured out the language, right? That, that a lot of the rural folks uh, talk, you know, how they talked and got them interested in you know. That kind of thing. So, so yeah, I think the, to your point, if you're asking about there's there a kind of a moment. I, I would say not one singular moment or anything, one incident, but I'd say the World War, the, world, the era of the World Wars was really a kind of changing point. That world War World War One kind of began to start it um, and set a lot of the blocks in place, um, uh, but then World War Two. The, 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 the story beats are hitting talk today, right? Because there's sort of points where, you know, beat, 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 and then you see this sort of dramatic change. And we think of, and we talk a lot about, the talking points politically are exactly the same, except that the meanings of some of the words are completely different. Yeah, yeah. That's a, and that's a good point. Um, I'm really interested, again, if time would ever permit, in uh, looking at a, uh, 
an Arkansas leader of the early populist movement and, and kind of drilling into his language and, you know, uh, you know, and how, yeah, how later, how later politicians would come along and take some of his same language but, but use them in an entirely different meaning. And so, yeah, that's a good, good point. All right. Well, let's thank. Oh,